Testing, one, two, three, four. We'll be getting started in just a moment. But meanwhile, just glad to see people out there. Steve and Tanana Reeve here. Hello, everyone. We're just getting set up for you so we can have a great show. There it is, live. There it is. You got that? Okay. Okay. Cool. We can share it. And all right. Share it. Okay. We have all the little housekeeping things that we're doing, but it's all for you. And we're just so excited about what we're going to be talking to you about today. What an incredible year this has been. It really has. So we'll be with you in just a moment. How are you doing, T? Incredible can be good and bad. <laughs> Incredible can be good and bad. That's the so truth. It's three o'clock. Are we ready to go? I know. Uh, yeah, well, I guess let's go live. All right. Let's go live. And uh, testing one, two, three, and we are live. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi there. I'm Tanana Reeve Dude. And I'm Stephen Barnes. Welcome to Afrofuturism Live, yep. our broadcast on Facebook Live, where we talk to you about the wonderful world of black speculative fiction, also known as Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism. Futurism. We're going to define it. We're going to show you how you can be a part of it. We're going to tell you why it's important. We're going to have you know a wonderful time here today. We're having yes. fun, and we're always glad to see. Let's see who's propped up. This is Joshua and Howard and Rochelle and Thank Michael and Angela. Coming. Thank you, everybody, and they're you know all the people that are watching now and are going to be watching later on. We love you. We're just delighted that you're here. And yes. uh, let's kind of and yes. Then, and now I'm back. I've been uh, doing a little bit more housekeeping, but but in any it, case, as always, by the way, if you like what we're doing here, be sure to share because that's how we know. That's how we know. So I hope everyone is doing uh, very very well. We are very happy to be here with you to talk about Afrofuturism, which we both have a, a pretty uh, long history with. Uh, just, just so maybe we can introduce each other. Uh, let me see if I if I don't mess it up. Um, <laughs> he's published over a million words of fiction. I don't know. I'm just three over, million over words. three million. I don't know how he's counting that, but he counts that <laughs> three million. I words counted of fiction. every single word. He is Stephen Barnes is an author, a screenwriter, a master teacher. He is. Really crowning work is the alternate history Lion's Blood, it's possible. It's which, possible. which posits what would have happened if Africans had colonized the Americas, bringing European slaves and all kinds of mind-bending premises like that. He has lectured at Mensa. He has taught uh, many, many, many places, Screenwriting Expo at UCLA. Uh, Stephen Barnes. Yes, thank you, thank you. And this is Tanana Reeve Du, and she is, in many ways, the world's preeminent black horror writer. Um, oh, Pashaw. Oh, <laughs> the creator of the Black Immortals series, which uh, the crown of which is my soul to keep, uh, as well as many other things, and teaching at UCLA, w winner of the British Fantasy Award, winner of the NAACP Image Award. Which we shared. Which we shared for yes. mystery novel. So what... It's it's kind of fun, you know, th to think about that stuff. I have to kind of look over my shoulder to do that. And it's more fun to look ahead and see what's coming next. What an amazing time, by the way, for Afrofuturism, not just for independent artists uh, like ourselves, but in terms of the franchises, we're seeing so much more diversity in the Star Wars franchise than we ever did. We have Black Panther. We have A Wrinkle in Time. We have almost an embarrassment of riches. And we want to talk a little bit about why that matters why that's so important and how exciting it is to be alive right now. And also just to, to give us some perspective to see how far we've come. Yes. You know, I think that it, it, it's not that there are not still challenges. Oh my gosh, yes. Of, of course there are. Huge. But I I think that, that this generation of, of young people, you know, black people and their allies. Yes. And there are so many allies thank out there. Thank you, allies. Thank you, we thank you. We could you. not have done it without you. And we still need you and just... We need there. There's so much good that can be done now. Whether whether you're talking, looking at race, gender, sexual orientation, freedoms in general, just America's yes. place in the world, what's happening with artificial intelligence. There's so many things to look at. So many questions that tie into that. You know, who are we? Yes. And what is true about the nature of the world? Yes. We're having these conversations on a deep level right now. And Afrofuturism, I wanted to define sure what Afrofuturism is. Well, for, in order to do that, you first have to start by defining what science fiction. 
Okay, and it's 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 difficult in some ways, but one of the one of the definitions is is one that I really like. It was first attributed to Robert Heinlein, who is a great science fiction writer, Starship Troopers, and so forth and so on. And that is that there are three questions: What if, if only, and if this goes on? You know, what if, um, what what if we developed a faster than light drive? You know, if only Lincoln hadn't been shot. If we continue to pollute the earth, what will become of us? What That's if, like if only if this Butler's goes on? Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower is a great example of if this goes on. We'll yes. Be looking at social trends and extrapolating out a few years in the future. Social trends, technological trends, you know, things that are, are plausible technologies as well as quote unquote impossible technologies. You know, what if I had a time machine? I could go back in the past and do this, that, and the other. You know, I but was just saying, those questions. I was just saying that this is the first time in my life I kind of wish I had a time machine. What would you do if you had one? Uh, go back pre-November uh, 2016, <laughs> or even further, uh, even farther back when my mom got sick. But uh, you know, I never did understand the fascination with time machines because you know, as a black woman, it's hard to imagine an earlier time period that would have been better. But on a personal level, yeah, yeah. there are some things Absolutely. I wouldn't mind going back for at this point. So if that's science fiction, or if that is one way of looking at science fiction, then the what if, if only, if this goes on, science fictional premises and questions and queries and perspectives applied to the African diaspora. Yes. You know, what happened with the with colonialism in Africa, what happened with slavery, slaves being brought here. And it certainly started, in, and the primary mover has been black Americans. We're, we're, we've been searching for our mythology, yes. for our culture, trying to create. That's a big chunk of what was specifically taken away from us. You take away the names, religions, culture, language, history, mythology, and you end up with a blank slate upon which you can impress, you know, what I call slave 1.0, the, 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 so, the software, which is relatively incompatible with free man 1.0 software. Yes. So there, there's a problem once, once you finally let these people out. And I think that black people, like all groups of human beings, are attempting to ask the questions, who am I? Who are we? What is true about our place in the universe? Science As fiction to, does that. By it. the way, so many lies that have been told about us. Yes. So not only are we trying to find out who we are, we're trying to shed the lies yes. that, that a lot of us have even internalized. Well, I mean, you can't if if slave masters needed to keep people oppressed in order to keep them as as servants, they're going to be very specific sets of mythologies. And I remember very, very clearly when I was in first grade, and I enter into first grade, and the teachers break us up into reading groups. Mm -hmm. And I went to one reading group. A lot of the other black kids were in that reading group. Uh, my friend Howard Kokobun went into the reading group with the white kids and the Asian kids, and I thought, Hey, you know, I'm smart. You know, Howard didn't get into the smart group like I did. <laughs> then as soon as they heard me read, they turned around and they put me in the group with Howard and but the they, white kids. they just assumed, uh, they assumed because, because, of this, because of my skin color that, you were, would that, that, I would, that I'd be in the slow reading group. Uh, that's part of that mythology that we're talking about. It's, it's a lot to crawl out from underneath. Yeah. And science fiction is the mythology of the 20th, 21st century. Yes. It, it, it is saying this is who we are. We and are creatures of, of mind and heart. And up until, we, we're going we're gonna to get into that, but and, that's and just Af as, as, a, as a basis to get Af started with. Afrofuturism, the black speculative arts, you may call it, is the science fiction, fantasy, horror, magical realism of the black diaspora. And, um, yes, dreaming a better world. And as a matter of fact, that reminds me, speaking of dreaming a better world, I am the daughter of civil rights activists. I don't know if my father, John Dew, is watching, but if you are, hi, Dad, I'll see you soon. Um, and my late mother, Patricia Stevens Dew, who died in 2012. Now, you see her pictured here during protests in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, where she was arrested many times on the right. You see her at a theater protest in 1963. My father's picture is, you can see his profile if you know what he looks like right under the When Mars Invaded Earth uh, sign. But on the, on, the, on the left, here she is being dragged away again after an arrest. Now notice she's wearing these dark glasses because she was tear gassed at the age of 19 uh, during a protest march. And from that time on, 
and I mean the whole time I knew her, she was wearing dark glasses to protect her eyesight. And my mother was one of these people, you can see, she was willing to put it all on the line, all on the line, facing arrest, facing beatings. My aunt Priscilla Kaza got kicked in the stomach um, during a protest. They were willing to put it all on the line to build a better future. And that's the way she was. Because, you know, when she was a kid, all she really wanted, like all kids do, was to believe that that she was, uh, well, first, all kids like to believe they're special, number one. But at the very least, they, the world beats that out of us. <laughs> we we want to believe we're, we're equal. You know, we're human, right? We're human. And in 1954, when the Brown versus the Board of Education decision came down, she just knew so integration was going to happen immediately. And she started working from the time she was in high school to prepare her school for integration. Well, she never actually got to see an integrated school. Uh, Brown never reached uh, where she was growing up in Florida by the time she graduated and went to college. So basically she decided since change was slow, she was going to create change for herself, which is what led to starting that core chapter, the Congress of Racial Equality with her sister and starting these protests. And I'm telling you, it was only my mom and her sister and a handful of people who started the movement that turned into those big crowds that you see in that picture in the right. And the way she processed her trauma from being manhandled by police, from being tear gassed, from being called the N-word, um, and I'm sure at times from losing hope, really, was through the arts. She was a huge horror fan. Mm. So it's not a coincidence that her daughter, uh, Tanana Reeve, uh, would, would also take up uh, horror, you know, <laughs> writing horror. Now, I, have a, I have a question for our reading audience. Reading horror, sure. How many of you have used fiction, movies, to music to process powerful emotions? If you've ever had that experience where you were just... you. You're feeling something that is so horrible or, or in some cases so positive that you need to do something to get out of yourself. If you've experienced that with, with fiction, with books, movies, I mean, just give us some likes and let's know yeah, so that, we that, we, we, that you also understand that, that art can be a doorway through which you can express or escape your emotions. And my mother told me uh, when I was growing up, thank you, uh, for the uh, likes coming in. Thank My mother you. <laughs> told me when I was growing up, I went to jail so you wouldn't have to, which frankly, I've still taken to heart. It's really one of my life goals not to go to jail. I'm terrified of the, <laughs> the kind of encounters that she had. But she she used horror to de-stress. She taught me to use horror to de-stress. And in becoming a part of that black speculative fiction world, I was introduced to Afrofuturism and, and the wider meaning of what that is. It's not just like, for instance, with horror, you can take the trauma of fictitious characters to sort of leech out your own personal trauma or make sense of your own personal trauma. But when it comes to futurism, that real life world building my mother was doing as an activist, it, that is a very, very specific goal. That is a very specific objective. And in this photo, you see me with the great Angela Davis. That's amazing. And I met her earlier. Uh, I, I met her in 2016 at a, a conference called Black Women Rise in Florida. And she talked a little bit about Afrofuturism within the context of being an optimist. Because here's the thing. Angela Davis has more reason. She's been arrested. She's been accused of murder. She's been considered a radical. Uh, I mean, her life is full of reasons to be pessimistic. But instead, when you meet her, she is just so gracious and gentle and full of light. And I asked her about this at the Black Women Rise conference. And she said, it's not that I'm optimistic because I see the world through rose-colored glasses. It's that if the work that you've done for so many decades and years would make a difference in the future, we have to be able to imagine a different future even though there are no guarantees. But in order to do the work we do, however we do it, whether as artists or activists, we have to believe a different kind of world is possible. And this has been part of what human beings have done in terms of creating mythology since the very beginning of the human race. Yes. That we make stories about what the moon is, what the earth is, what death is, what birth is, what the relationship between human beings and animals are. Every group of human beings on this planet has their own mythology saying this is who we are, except one group. Black Americans had all that taken away from us. So from the very beginning, we started 
making up stories yes. about what we were. They started with just folk tales, and they moved onwards from there. I mean, the, the, the Afrofuturistic movement is over a century old. You know, and the, the it was only named in the nineties. That's but, right. But it's definitely been around. <laughs> and when we have been here, you know. Yes. So I mean, it's like my experience with with Afrofuturism is, you know, sure. Um, you know, I guess I would start with watching science fiction movies on television, movies like you know When Worlds Collide, mm -hmm. and I would notice that okay, so this planet is going to strike Earth, and they build spaceships to rescue all the people worthy of being saved. And all of those people, every single one of them, is white. None of them look like me. And when I mention this to people, they kind of say, oh, well, that's just the time. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with being put into the slow reading group when I'm in first grade. No. Um, and and it I, has nothing to do with certain segments of the American population wishing there were no people of color here at all. That's right. I mean, wish it, it, it's literal wish fulfillment. I, I would think so. They're basically <laughs> saying, we wish you weren't here. We wish we did not have to mess with you. And, th you know, it's it's not, you know, why why don't they want us to compete? Why don't they want us here? Well, I remember, and I've talked about this before, the first time I realized that there was a serious problem and that um, certain people were not going to see the problem. Now, let me, let me make sure I understand, that I express something. I don't think that, because I believe in human equality, I think that all of the problems here are related to basic human issues, not that one group has you know particular problems more than another group. It's just our history has created certain things with us. However, that said, I remember going to the movies and seeing a movie called Damnation Alley. Uh, I've mentioned this before, that Paul Winfield and, and Jan Michael Vincent and George Papard are traveling in a nuclear-powered Winnebago across an atomic wasteland. And... They are traveling. I saw this with a friend of mine named Dan, white guy. And um, there's a scene where they come to the, the wreckage of Las Vegas. And out of the wreckage of Las Vegas comes the last woman in the world. And she's white. And I turned around and I looked to my friend and I said, they're going to kill Paul Winfield. And he said, why would you say that? I said, well, look, there's a woman... They're not going to pretend he's not interested in her. They're not going to let him compete for her. The only thing they've got, they, they can do that that's left is kill him. And Dan said, you know, God, you are so cynical. And, and about five, five minutes later, Boom. he was eaten by giant cockroaches. Giant cockroaches. <laughs> so, Screaming and bleeding in pain. Uh, Dan didn't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I went home and I was thinking to myself, not only does this happen, not only does this happen with monotonous regularity, but the people who are doing it aren't even conscious of the fact that this is what they're doing. No. That, and I, you know, I remember seeing, you know, images like Uhura and Star Trek. Yeah, this is like probably, I'm trying to think of it, my first exposure to science fiction, period. Right. Okay, not just on TV, but in literature or whatever was probably um, Star Trek. And Lieutenant Uhura, played by the wonderful, talented, yeah. and beautiful Michelle Nichols, became that image of a potential version of me in the future, sitting on the deck of the Starship Enterprise, the communications director. Now, now, look, they made fun of her in the movie Galaxy Quest. You know, the Sigourney mm. Weaver character was sort of the Nichelle Nichols character, wow. and she's complaining that she never does anything except repeat the captain's orders. Right. But when Nichelle Nichols got sick of repeating the captain's orders, and she complained about it, Dr. Martin Luther King encouraged her to stay on that show. Yes. Why? Because representation matters. It totally matters. Images matter. And I'm so glad she did stay on the show. She has inspired uh, so many people um, to uh, sometimes to, to create, sometimes to actually join the space program. The thing about art is that once you put it out in the world, you don't know who's touched by it. You don't right. know where it can go. It takes wings and it takes flight. And it really is on one level like the oxygen we breathe. Uh, people who are not in a situation where they don't see themselves represented every day, day in, day out, over and over, don't really understand what it feels like when you're on the other end of that. When, no, they have no when concept. When you're absent, when you're invisible, when you're unaccounted for and, and invalidated. And so, I mean, one of the things that I think it's really important to do 
is to ask yourself, if you see yourself as part of a marginalized community, if you look at this as a thing that human beings do, it's smart for you to look around and wonder who you are marginalizing. Right. And right. it's like, I know that I do it. And I am so, I'm sorry about it. I, I can't spend all my time thinking about it. I'm not going to spend my time there. But I'm going to think about, you know, are there you know, disabled people? Am, am I depicting women? Right. In, in, in a respectful way. Am I, am I depicting gay people, yeah, pe people in, in, in a respectful way? People speak with derision about the age of political correctness. But when, when people raise concerns to me, I really want to listen because I know how painful it was for me to be left out, for me to be uh, to feel invalidated and, and invisible. So, yeah, I think that's very important. And Invalidated, and, invisible, or killed. Yeah. I mean, literally yeah. wiped out. You know, the, the fantasies of the other group is we wish you would die, or at the very <laughs> least, you, you are not you, worth surviving. We, we wish you would die saving us. Yes, you, we wish you would. In a lot of cases. <laughs> so one of the titans to address this, obviously, the tallest one, um, it is, and Nala Hopkinson is also a titan, but Octavia E. Butler, the tall one in this photograph, and this is a photo by David Fenley. I also I always want to give the photo credit. We took this picture at Howard University. I don't remember what year, but boy, did we feel like we were in the middle of um, a party that would not stop. It was the growth of Afrofuturism, and we had a road show, people. Um, I cannot tell you how many times we would meet and other artists would be there. Nettie Akorafor came along um, later. Did she ever appear with us in Octavia? Maybe she was a little too sure. late. I'm not sure. I don't think we were all together. We would, have gotten, we would have gotten a picture. A little too late. But the late L.A. Banks um, was, 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 if not in this event, she was in several. So we had this road show where we would talk about black science fiction. Or We didn't actually ever call it Afrofuturism. No, we didn't. We, we didn't use the term. The term was in use, but we were not using it. No. So... You know, you you shine at, at, at horror and fantasy. Although she has, you know, been in a best of the year anthology of, of for science fiction because she's just that kind of writer. Uh, I went specifically into aiming at the science fiction field, and I wrote for Outer Limits and Twilight Zone. I wrote, you know, multiple novels with Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. Been in my own, and been nominated for Hugo and Nebula. But you know, I. I could feel that for most of my career, I was shying away from talking about certain issues, not doing certain You're still certain shying things. away from talking about certain issues. What certain issues is that, honey? <laughs> <laughs> what certain issues? <laughs> oh, all right. I was certain literally... Issues. Certain issues. I was literally scared that if I addressed race directly... I mean, there for, we for go. Almost 20 years, I was the only... Race. <laughs> Yeah, say, say the secret way and win twenty dollars. The third rail. <laughs> I, I was literally afraid that if I, you know, as being the only black male science fiction writer in the world for almost twenty years, as far as I could determine, I was scared that if I if I you know specifically attempted to address my negritude, mm -hmm. that the white audiences who I counted on to pay my bills, buy my books keep you know be able to keep a roof over my head and my in, in food on my daughter's table that I wouldn't be able to survive so this led to feelings of being inauthentic mm. feelings of betraying myself mm. feelings that you know I might as well be one of those guys that set the roaches on Paul Winfield mm. you know because I was not being true I was not being honest but I was scared I was actually scared if I do this if I kind of come out of the closet as it was, I was Stephen Barnes' science fiction writer who happened to be black. Right. But if I did this, I would be Stephen Barnes' black science fiction writer. Whoops. And 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 did, was there even um, an audience? That was the question when you started out. Yes. Now, and now by the time I came along, I was so fortunate, having been published on the heels of Terry McMillan, that black commercial fiction was taking off on its own, whether or not it was speculative. And as a speculative fiction writer, I got caught up in that, and I, I met the uh, the winds of Octavia's rise uh, among feminist readers and black women readers. And, you know, Octavia, whether or not she actually felt fearless, there is such fearlessness in her writing and in the, in the way that she confronts issues. Often it feels like it's issues of race, but really... Um, we talked to Octavia about this, and give us some likes if, if you've read Octavia Butler's work, if her work has changed your life. Because we're going to discuss her a little impact. bit. Let's just go a little deeper yeah, made an into Octavia. Yeah, thank you. you, thank you. Yeah, that's but, right. We love her, too. But um, yes. Love to see that. Thank you. But uh, <laughs> and what she was dealing with, her biggest fear, if you see these themes coming back again and again, and, and Don. Oh, well, let's, let's talk, let's give a little bit of her history. 
first. Um, she also saw a lack of representation. She would see movies like Devil Girl from Mars, and she didn't see any little black girls in, in this movie. But she also looked at Devil Girl from Mars and said, I can do better than that. Right. Not just I can represent, but I can literally take what they're doing and do it better. So she began to, to do her own writing. And she was she attended one of the Clarion science fiction workshops because she didn't know any black science fiction writers. At which one of the teachers, Harlan, there, Harlan Ellison, Harlan Ellison, uh, the paid wonderful her Harlan scholarship, Ellison scholarship, I yes. believe. But her teacher, I believe, was Samuel L. Delaney. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. So, so Harlan paid her way in. Samuel Delaney was her teacher. One and of that, the great pioneers, by the way, in science fiction. He is amazing. Yes. Absolutely Someone amazing. Someone asked the question, what category does Samuel R. Delaney fit genre-wise? Well, science that, fiction. At that time, absolutely science fiction. He's branched away from science yes. fiction now, but he is one of the great pioneers and masters of science fiction, regardless of race. Yeah, his use of language yes. and imagery is on the level of a James Joyce. Right. He was the James Joyce of science fiction absolutely. when he was there. And the field did not welcome him. They, they literally tore him apart until they realized what a genius he was, at which point they all, you know, put him on their shoulders and say, see, we're not prejudiced. We'll, <laughs> we'll accept a genius as being our equal. <laughs> right. So, so that Samuel R. Delaney was Octavia Butler's teacher, and that was where she had her first exposure to a science fiction workshop. And of course, the rest is um, history in terms of Octavia Butler and her work. Um, and, and we see in her themes over her works, as I was going to say, in Dawn, it's post nuclear annihilation. Uh, several human survivors have been brought aboard a spaceship ship and a black woman has to decide who will go back to repopulate the earth and all the issues um, that she has to deal with, not just with the alien species, but with the humans. That's always a component of Octavia's work. There's the science fictional premise, but there's also the human premise that comes together. Kindred also, um, this idea of a contemporary black woman who is in an interracial marriage and in, in what was then contemporary in the 1970s, whisked back in time, thus who needs time machines, uh, to the uh, antebellum slavery period, where she gets caught up with literally having to save her white forebear, who is going to rape her black forebear, <laughs> to create her family line over and over again, which makes her actually complicit in the events uh, in a way that's very um, emotionally uh, complex. Well, if you can think about how deep her humanity have to, had to be in order to conceive of a story where she was taking responsibility for the humanity of the people right. involved here. That is, um, that's a level of honesty that most people, frankly, can't, can't rise to. Right. What Octavia was most afraid of, specifically, she said the thing that most bothered her about human beings was two things. Do any of you know? <laughs> Do any of you know? Any, anyway. any of you? Okay, well, we'll see. There, there were two things. One is our hierarchical nature. Ding, ding, ding. And the second is our tendency to place ourselves and our tribe higher on that hierarchy than other people. Yeah. In other words, it is exactly this tendency that leads to racism, sexism, homophobia, nationalism, them. almost any ism you can think of. My, my, and I think it relates to childhood stuff. It relates to, you know, my dog is the best, my daddy's the strongest, my mommy's the prettiest. If you don't grow out of that, it gets to my neighborhood is the best, my street is the best, my school is the best, my state is the best, my nation is the best, my gender is the best, so you, on and on and on. You see that theme threading through so much of her work. You can probably think of other examples. With Don, it was that the alien species considered itself, while it thought it was not hierarchical, it actually lorded over humans as if they obviously did believe and, that they were superior. In, in the Pattern Master uh, trilogy, the, the stronger and weaker that, telepaths. That, that's right. On Yanwe and Doro, you know, just he, Doro felt that because of his strength, he had the right to control. Right. You know, I have the, I have the right to control these, these people. They are cattle. You see it in, in Fledgling, her last novel, with the, the young black vampire who can walk in the day because of her her melanin, rather than this girl feeling like she's superior, the other vampires feel superior to her because she's a mutant and they're basically trying to kill her and everyone she knows. So, so can you see how, how Octavia would take her concerns that have to do with race and gender and then turn them and then exaggerate them? Now, yes. these are vampires, okay? right? You know, these are aliens. These are immortals. And you, she exaggerated those concerns, but it's right there. It's that 
what is it going to take for human beings to get along with each other? Yes. At what point will we stop hurting each other, stop yes. killing each other, stop dominating each other? And she take she took these ideas and she grounded them in science. She studied biology thoroughly. She if she was writing about you know. A, biological species, you know, plants and animals, she would actually take a trip up the Amazon to do field research. Right. And I have just so much respect for a mind that operates that way. She would ground it because she has this passionate urge, why do we do this? To yes. find out why we do this. How do we get out of this? Because she can see how we can destroy the earth, human beings over plants, human beings over animals, how we can destroy other nations, America against other nations, right. how... Men can dominate women, how women can manipulate men, how straight people can force gay people to, 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 to stay in the closet, how whites can dominate blacks. And if, 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 the, if we ever turned that around, we'd be doing the same thing, and I wouldn't mind an opportunity. Excuse Did I say that out loud? Uh, <laughs> that's what a lot of people are afraid of. That, of course true. that's what they're afraid of. But you know, the truth of the matter is, uh, when people have equality, they just want to live their lives, generally. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think how that works. Well, I <laughs> think that if you ask yourself that question, there are only two basic questions to ask yourself. What what am I, or what is what is humanity, and what is the world that we see? And I tend to believe that, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs says that as soon as the fear is removed, when you stop being hungry, when you stop worrying about a, a, a roof over your head, you start thinking about emotional connection. You right. start thinking about, you know, that the things that we really want on the other side of fear are joy and love and sure. connection. Sure. So, so most of the violence, most of the ugly things that happen, happen be because people are afraid. And, you know, Octavia, uh, we talked about this with Octavia, that, that her work wasn't always coming from a place of optimism. In fact, we, no. we talked to her. It most said, certainly was you've not. You've been concerned. You've been, some people have labeled you somewhat pessimistic, and she was like, moi? <laughs> 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 but, but she knows, you know, she or she knew. It's really hard even to still talk about her in past tense. She knew that she was working out her own fears, uh, not for herself so much, but for humankind in her work, hopefully holding up a mirror to us through all these different kinds of stories so we would stop in our tracks and think and maybe not ruin the planet. We talked about climate change. Well, we, we talked, talked about, about politics, politics and, and, and philosophy. And philosophy. And she really worried for our future, for all these, well, and, and, and a lot of those worries, uh, some of them anyway, have come to pass. We can Absolutely. see, wow, she was right. And in fact, if you read Parable of the Sower, which is supposed to be near future, it, it feels nearer and nearer every day. In fact, there are some communities that are probably already living uh, halfway in the world of Parable of the Sower, depending on where you are. See, but back, we're right back to the question of what science fiction is, because that, that's that what if. If only, and if this goes on. Yes. If you want to know how to do what it is that Octavia did, then you start with the powerful emotions. Yes. You, uh, you address some particular thing. You use the powerful emotions to exaggerate it, extrapolate it, push it into the future, make it right. bigger. Right. And then you tell a story about that bigger, clearer world. You do that, and the, the majority of the science fiction that people have praised over the years has in some way or another asked questions about what the universe is or what human beings are. Now, science fiction has often been criticized because it spends too much time thinking about the machines, not enough about the people. Right. Octavia was deeply humane. It's all about the people. Deeply humane. All about the people. All about what are we? Where are we going? What are we doing to each other? So, Who it, are we when we're telepaths? Who are we when we're slave owners? Who are we... When we're in interaction with an alien species, or we are the alien species, That's I right. mean, who are we? If if you think about that, then you know, there there are different things you can do with that with the question of, of what what science fiction is, what Afrofuturism is. You can imagine the future in which things get worse, and you can address that, or you can think about the future in which we've gotten past it. And you can help us see how we did it. So whether, if you're a pessimist, then put that pessimism out there. If you're an optimist, show us how we got it right. Octavia tended to give us more warnings than anything else. But she was always giving us a sense that if we can connect with each other emotionally, that love and connection is a way out of this trap that we've got. That trap being these basic perceptions that we have that force us to say this, not that, that binary thinking. Yes. This is not that. This is better than that. 
This is worse than that. This is higher than that. That is one of the core ways of thinking that most people fall into. If you, if you look at Facebook and look at all the political arguments on Facebook, over the smallest things, you cannot look at that without seeing people just think that their point of view, their tribe, their, you know, their, their group is not just different from, but better. And that the amount of death and suffering and slavery and just the, the horrible things that we have done to each other out of fear and out of l saying that other people are less than us cannot even come close to being calculated. So that's what I see as what scared Octavia more than anything else. Yeah. Now, and luckily we have art to yeah. help us process all of this. And uh, what If art has saved you <laughs> over the past few months, let's see some likes and some hearts. If art has made your life better, your evenings better, your days better, I know it has for mine. Oh because, my God! Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, without you know, without being able to turn on a movie, open a book, or write, actually create True. something. It's like that. That creation is massive for me. You know, just we're going to talk a little bit about creation, but we've talked about the fear that Octavia felt, and I think. I wish so much that she were here now, that we could have conversations about what is happening now because of people like you, because we can do shows like this and there are podcasts and shows and books. The fact is that from that original group of just a few of us, there are now so many creators that I can't even come close to keeping track of how many there are. And it is a, it's so wonderful. It, it's hard for me to even tell you how much it matters to me. We're talking about Get in touch with those emotions. Get in touch with those emotions. The, a, a very simple model of how to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in your life. And this will all go into how fear can be turned into power. In the middle, you see what? What is, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? To the right, it says why. Why do you want it? Why do you want that thing? The, the, the why, the emotions, are the energy. They're the fuel. It's like... You know, I talk to, I'm talking to my son. He says, you know, he, he, I want him to do his, I want him to do his homework. You know, well, why does he want to do his homework? When you're a kid, you do your homework because you don't want to get spanked. In other words, it's as an avoidance of pain. But what the education process hopefully does, the thing that I want for him more than anything else, is that he'll get clear on what he wants to accomplish in his life and find his own reasons to want to do these things. Because only after you are clear on what it is you want, and why you want it, does it make any sense to ask the how? Right. So now let's take a look at that hierarchicalism and the fear that Octavia had. We're going to show you how somebody has, is creating a bridge to the future, yes. a positive future with that. One somebody. I mean, now this, you know, obviously you saw the protest photos if you were here earlier from my mother in the 1960s. Well, our protests haven't ended. Uh, the NFL players have had protests. There are young people, Black Lives Matter. Uh, still having protests because, uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but most famously is the, the, the police violence and police shootings against unarmed um, black men, women, even children. And, and not just blacks. Native Americans are very high risk for these kinds of police shootings. That doesn't get the same publicity. But uh, POC in general. Right. You know, POC in general. And what's ho the most horrible thing to me is not just people saying it's not happening. It's people trying to say that these black people protesting don't even believe it's happening. That they're not even willing to grant that we are being honest about our fear. They don't have to agree that it's happening. But they actually will tell us that we don't mean it. That it's just political theater. Oh. That, the de that the denial is so deep. The inability to, to wrap their minds around the possibility. Well, maybe these people do believe that they're being threatened. Maybe these people do believe there's something to threaten them. That's that's a step in the right direction because then right. you can at least ask, is it a legitimate feeling? But if you're just going to say you're lying about it, you can't even ask the next question. So the, the danger is that the underlying hierarchicalism in a community will lead to differential valuing of lives. Right. That is why Black Lives Matter is important, because of the very hierarchicalism that Octavia Butler was afraid of. This, exactly. is, this, is, this is that fear in the flesh, in the in flesh and blood draining into the gutters in our cities, and people yeah. saying, not just it's not happening, but saying, you don't even believe it's happening. Right, and, and there's such a misunderstanding because there's so much ignorance about those statistics. There's so much ignorance about the, the, the 
wealth gap there, and, and educational gaps and all sorts of ways that institutional racism really does continue to suppress blacks that when they hear black lives matter they hear only black lives matter yes. when in fact if you know anything about what's actually happening you know it's black lives matter too that's right black lives also black matter lives they pretend matter. not to understand that that's what's being said when you say blue lives matter we know blue lives matter because <laughs> if a cop is killed there is a parade Oh my, yeah, you know they, they they will actually they will actually stop the world the, and and honor the worst and that, highest charges and they won't rest until they find you. That's right. Whereas you could be an unarmed kid, um, like this poor child in David in uh, Texas, leaving a party uh, and and shot just for no literally no reason, and it's hard to get justice. I think in that case, uh, that that's uh, Jordan. Uh, his name is Jordan, and, and I believe that there will be justice in that case. But it's That's, rare. So, look, so what we're saying is that you start out, you feel fear, you feel anger, you feel outrage, and you say to yourself, what do I do with this? And you can, you can just support art or po political causes that relate to this, or you can do what a very... And or. And or what a, an amazing young man named Ryan Coogler did which is he created a small film called Fruitvale Station. Based on the, um, the police killing of Oscar Grant in, in the uh, Oakland area. Now, what is this coming into? This goes directly to that question of hierarchicalism. It is saying, let me humanize this young man. Right. Let me put some heart in there. He's not just a thug. It's not just an actor. This is a human being who was cut down. And was and, loved and, and had a future that yes. he was entitled to. See, this is what art does. Art is a communication from one person's heart to another person's heart. And if you write a story about this, you and the person on the other end of the story feels what you wrote, then your work of art has been successful. Well, Ryan Coogler created a little movie. And the, the, the trick with... with working up into Hollywood is you start with tiny movies and you move up to short films and small films before you go for major films. But what he did was he took his passion, he took his fear, fear for himself, fear for his children, fear for his family, and he put that passion with the skills necessary to make an award-winning small film. Fruitvale Station. And it really did help open a lot of people's eyes who were, in fact, in some cases, completely unaware that we had this problem with police violence. In this case, it was Metro Police. But, uh, you know, anyone with a gun um, can be a threat to, to people uh, if that person with a gun is afraid of you, on, literally on site. Now, what he did was he took that in that question, how do you stop the violence if the violence is based on a hierarchy that says that you are less human than me? You create images that humanize. He did an amazing thing. He took his win with Fruitvale Station, and he created a heroic image that was connected to one of the most dominant cinematic mythologies in American history, Rocky. Yes. And, and he, he created Creed. Creed. Now, Creed was not just hugely successful, it was also the first movie in Hollywood history where a non-white male lead had a love scene where the movie earned over $100 million. $100 million is, a standard, is the standard measurement of success. It means it has crossed over the entire culture, has embraced it. When he created an image of humanity and heroism that was so powerful that people were willing to identify with him across racial lines, because there was no way for black audiences to make that movie successful by themselves, that successful by themselves. Um, when he did that, he created a meme saying, we're here too. Right. We matter too. When you cheer for somebody in that movie, yes. you are seeing their humanity. And it would be my guess that if the cop who shot that guy at Fruitvale Station had seen Creed the night before and loved it, maybe, yeah, that he would have been less likely to pull that trigger. Not more likely. I'll, yeah. I'll grant he would not have been more likely. Yeah, he would not have been more likely. It had to have a positive effect. Now, here's the thing where it becomes beautiful. You know what we're working up to? Yeah, because... You guys know what we're working up to? Because... Shout out if you know what we're working up to. Hello, Black Panther. That's right, because Ryan Coogler 
took the success of Fruitvale Station, took that into Creed, and took the success of Creed and turned it into Black Panther. Powerful, powerful images of men and black men and women in uh, an independent nation that has never been colonized. Its resources have only been its own resources. He makes a big deal about that. Um, the Chadwick Boseman, uh, who, who played Black Panther, has even talked about how they talked about the, the accent that he could not... Now, you know, some Africans have some complaints about the accent. No I doubt. But, but in terms of what they were trying to do, and he's just an actor was he could not go with an English accent or some accent that would make it sound like he'd been educated in, in Europe, which so often happens. No, this is an African story. This is an African nation. And you have both the uh, ancient in a lot of the imagery and the uh, technological uh, with Shuri, who is, in fact, beyond Tony Stark in terms of her uh, technical capabilities. Now, what happens when you do this? Not only are you saying we're human. Not only are you saying we can be heroes, you're saying we have courage, we have intellect, we have beauty, we have culture. The, I expect that, that Black Panther is going to be a massive worldwide success because there is a gap between the lie that slave owners promoted about what we were and the reality of what we are. Anytime there's a gap like that, I'm speaking to the artists out there, anytime you see a lie in the culture, anytime you see something that people believe that is not true, you take your anger about that, your fear about that, and you turn it into work. You turn it into art. Or if you're not a creator, teach somebody to create. Or if, you don't, if you're not a teacher or a creator, then just support the art that is speaking the truth that you feel in your heart. And speak, speaking of fans, which, which those of you that would describe you, this this is not a real wired cover. I wish it were. But <laughs> it's a mock-up by an artist named Darian Robbins, who's done um, a lot of fan art uh, surrounding Black Panther. And we thank you for that image, because that is so electrifying. Again, to feel honored, to feel recognized, to feel seen. That's a word I hear uh, young people using a lot. I feel seen. Yes. And, and that's what we're striving to do in Afrofuturism. It's like you're saying, I'm here. And not just I'm here, but really that we can lead. Yes. That we can lead. Because, because any population uh, that is willing to cut off the voices of a huge percentage of its own people, and the very people who have been dealing with struggle, the very people who have the, the tools for struggle, when it's time for you to struggle and you're not listening to those voices, guess what? Your struggle fails. Your struggle falls short. You, we need all hands on well, deck. And it's not only that, but any <laughs> group of healthy people thinks that they're, you know, to be enlightened is to see the, the, the interconnection. But before enlightenment, when you're just chopping wood, carrying water, you're, you, you should think your family is something special. Right. Your group is something special. You can't be equal by thinking you're equal. You have to be equal by thinking you're better getting out on the track and competing with everything you've got inside you. And then afterwards, you can say, you know, you ran a good race, too. <laughs> but when you're running, you don't run to come in equal. You run to beat them. Look, before we get to Black Panther, there's that question, can it succeed? Will it possibly succeed? Well, think about something for just well, a second. Well, someone here in the comments, um, Vicky Bean wrote, get out, hello. That, thank you. Sink into the floor. J Boom. Jordan Peele's $250 million hit, Get Out, is not shying away from the question of race and race relations. It, it is not pretending that it's about something it's not about. It is going right down the line at the problem to the point where Jordan Peele told my class at UCLA he was worried when he was writing the script that it would seem too confrontational, that people wouldn't get it. And it just so happened that it came out during the Trump era when people were like, oh, yeah, we get it. <laughs> but also, Why do we get also it? <laughs> that he had, he had a supreme skill, the ability to take fear and turn it with laughter when he needed to. Yes. Okay. I mean, there are a lot so of things he, that play. See, he's bringing that skill to it. But the raw emotion... The fear that he will not be seen, that yeah. he will not be loved, that or there is understood. no one to trust, yeah. understood. See, that's the fear at, at the core of American racial issues. Black people feel that toward white people. Can we, you know, we can't trust you, can we? White people saying to black people, can you trust us? Will you ever be able to trust us? And trying to work together. Art can bridge that gap. We can, communication bridges that gap. Honest opening of hearts bridge that gap. I say that America is ready for Black Panther. Oh, I, absolutely. I, I really believe 
that Get Out showed us that the, that the country and the world is ready for images like this. We are ready to say, well, if you're not this over here, who are you? And the people who step up and can do that with real power and passion and skill are going to make a killing. They're going to do great. Yes. You know, and so that's what we're, we're praying for is that there are people out there like you who take this time on a, on a Sunday afternoon and learn a little something. And I want to shout out also some of the independent Afrofuturistic artists because we, we've talked a lot about um, the franchises with, with uh, say, Black Panther. Absolutely. But you have artists like John Jennings out there, um, Milton Davis with, with his Black Speculative Fiction, uh, Belgian Jeffers, um, who, who are my Facebook friends and who are holding it down. There's a whole Afrofuturism group here on Facebook. So th this is a large community of creators. We're talking about some of the creators that everybody knows, but I also believe that the more success a, uh, a project like Black Panther has, the more it, it opens that, that hungry audience for more and more and more and more more because you can't have a Black Panther every six months. Or no, you can't. Month. And the thing, you don't need to make, you know, a quarter million dollar movie. You know, you don't need to make a five million dollar movie or even a one million dollar movie. You need to tell your story to enough different people that they're figuring, you know, you're leading the way. You're saying something I have not heard. Let me support you. Yeah. And it's that a, an artist only needs 1,000 true fans to make a living. And if you are a true lover of science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and you have not been as exposed to Afrofuturism and some of these artists that, that we're talking about, what, a, what an opportunity to open that up for yourself, right? Because, because as a true lover of the speculative arts, you want to be surprised. You want to find something different. We don't want to see the same story rehashed and rehashed. We want new mythologies. We want new heroes and heroines. And we want new stories. And that's what part of what I'm trying to do in my art is provide new stories. My African Immortals. Uh, well, is it what, what do you call for? Is it philology? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Quad like, quadrilogy. Quadrilogy. Okay, quadrilogy. Quadrilogy. Um, and, It'll and, be a quintrilogy. And, and his uh, Lion's Blood and Zulu Heart. Um, and Octavia's work, we're all trying to, well, really, we're just trying to express our own truth. But in doing so, hopefully we're also providing you with new voices, new faces, and new art that you can enjoy. Well, that's fear, what Octavia was afraid of, hierarchicalism, fear. This is how you take this, that fear, that emotion, and change the world. What do you want to do? You want to create art. Yes. Why do you want to create that art? Or enjoy so, art. So that, your, so that your children can live in a better world, so that you're not afraid walking down the streets. So you can express the joy or the wonder you feel at the universe or whatever, but just make sure you've got this thing you want to do and you've got this reason you want to do it. Now go out and work your butt off. Yes. So this there, is the time, people. This, this is, is the this time. is this is the time. There's never. I mean, I'm not. This is not a hyperbole. There has never been a time to be a creator of speculative fiction as a person of color, or really probably anyone. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't even need to. You don't need Hollywood to make movies anymore. Right. You know, there the, the, the potentials are are so huge right now. Yes. The technology has made it possible for you to go directly to the audience that you're trying to reach. But what you are going to need is what? What are you looking at? The shirt, Black Panther. <laughs> okay, go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry. No, it's okay. Interrupt. You, know, what, you can interrupt me like that anytime you want. <laughs> this is the time. This is the time. You know, it is. We are the hope and the dream of the slave. This is the time. And I'm not just talking to the black people out there. I'm talking to our allies. That means anyone who has that sense that we're all connected, that we're part of one family. And that we can all build a better world together, which yeah. is really what this is all about. It's about creating healthier people who can create a better world. And that's really what, what Afrofuturism is to me and what it has meant to me, actually. If you want that sense of creating a better world for your children than the one you were born into, let's see some likes. Let's see some loves. I know that I'm willing to do anything for my family, yes. my community. And you guys, those of you who believe in the equality of human beings, who are willing to put yourselves on the line, willing to support art, create art, teach people how to do art, and want to be you're my family. And excited by new mythologies and new stories and new ways of looking at the world. Definitely, we're all part of that same family. Yeah. You know, I guess if you... If you feel that there are oppressors that have pushed against you, you're right. If you feel that there are people who've tried to keep you down, you're right. 
If you feel that you've tried really hard in the past to create and keep your mood high and things collaborated against you, you're right. But it's also right that this is the time. There's yes. more than hope. There's opportunity. And we wanted to talk to you about just such a thing yes. right now. And it's the best opportunity we have ever, ever offered now, you. Now, speaking of no hyperbole, this is true. And by way of background, um, earlier this spring, we had a live Afro Futures in class for 10 weeks where we met and we did a lecture format like this where we talked about whatever the homework was, whether it was reading by Octavia Butler or Samuel R. Delaney or W.E.B. Du Bois or Nettie Okorafor, or whatever we were reading or whatever movie you were supposed to watch or whatever music you were watching. We did a lecture about it. And every week we also had a guest speaker who would come and, and, and we had interviewed someone who would come um, and share their wisdom with the class. So for week one, uh, we started with a bang with Luke Cage showrunner Chao Hadari Coker as our guest. And we were talking about um, intro to Afrofuturism with George Clinton and Luke Cage. And we went to Sun Ron, W.B. Du Bois. So we had guests ranging from Nadia Okorafor. You see her on the top left. She is a superstar. Yes, she is. Right now. Uh, we My talk, little sister. We talk about Get Out. Uh, with, and we had an interview with Reginald Hudlin, the director uh, who, who did Boomerang and also did uh, Django Unchained and a uh, producer of Django Unchained. Cosmic Chain, Slop. Cosmic Slop. Um, Space Traders. Space Traders. We uh, we looked at Ava DuVernay's documentary Thirteenth and interviewed this real life superhero. You see her on the top right, Brie Newsom. Yay! Who took the conf who, by the way, is also an artist and creator. She has a terrific short horror. Because you have to understand the, the the history of of America in order to understand how to create fiction that relates to that history that yes. is rooted in who we who it is that we really are. So it's a it's a 10 week uh, course and and now it's all digital downloads so you get the lectures and you get the interviews and you get the homework you do it at your own pace so you don't have to worry oh my gosh my schedule is too full you'll have the links do it when you can no one is going to push you except yourself and, and in that course, uh, what you get in that course is the 10 weeks of classes, the interviews with the artist, um, the recommendations for movies, books, short stories, art and music, all digital downloads. That value would be more than $1,200 just for that course, a 10-week course. And uh, if you're wondering about, you know, what it means, what it feels like, because Rory still said, I love this class. Afrofuturism has, has been a powerful tool in helping we as peoples of color, to quote Hamilton, write our way out of the oppression that would try to annihilate us. I must say that Tanana Reeve and Steve are two of the most engaging teachers, mentors that I have ever... Oh, that's so sweet. I can't even read that out. Loud. Oh, well, it's too okay. nice. Well, I'm going to read that from Misty Newton. <laughs> um, one of, and, and obviously you can see she's one of our white students. So when we say Afrofuturism is for everyone, we mean that. Mm -hmm. uh, several of my friends asked me if I felt the class had been worth it. If I had learned things that I would apply in my own writing, my answer to both questions is an emphatic yes. Now, it, we go beyond just what Afrofuturism is and how to create it as a technical thing. Because we go into uh, what's called self-care for social justice writers. This is an emotional care kit. And f whether your, your issue is, is finding, learning how to focus properly, learning how to go into flow state, how to heal yourself emotionally, how to deal with fear, how to summon creativity, how to relieve stress or banish insomnia. Insomnia, people. There are... A number of different tools that I've created over the over the years that make it possible for me to have written three million words and over thirty novels without this, losing your mind without right. losing my mind right. in the process. And the collection of tools, MP3s, um, if you were to buy those things separately, they would be at least two hundred and forty dollars, probably more. So that's our first bonus that comes with the ten weeks of the Afrofuturism class. That's but there's right. another bonus, which is one of my very favorite. Uh, well, okay, this is a lecture. Um, the three greatest mistakes new writers make. I teach uh, at Antioch University in the MFA program. I teach at BONA, Voices of Our Nation's Arts Foundation, uh, the, the writing workshop for writers of color. And I work with a lot of beginning writers. So this is especially for new writers, but sometimes those of us who are older writers need to hear it again too. So that's my lecture, uh, the three biggest mistakes new writers make. Now we go worse. We go far more deeply into an issue that a lot of artists have problems with, and that is how can you make a living creating art? Um, and it can be a difficult thing because the the artist creates from their heart and then hopes they can find a market. 
the business person finds a market and then tries to create something for it. So art for an artist, marketing can feel like prostitution. It can feel like, like you're not being true to yourself. But it's possible to create art ethically. It is possible to market ethically. And I went to a, a dear friend of mine who is a Sufi master and actually created a course that, that applies spiritual techniques to marketing so that if you as an artist need to understand how this works from an internal point of view, that we actually can open the door to you being able to understand marketing and sales for an artist from or a person. From a spiritual perspective, that gives you permission to succeed. So what, just to break it down, we have the 10-week go-at-your-own-pace digital download Afrofuturism course. We have the self-care for social justice writers or warriors, however you want to call it. <laughs> uh, the three greatest mistakes new writers make, the, uh, my MP3, and also the spiritual entrepreneur. So if you add all of that together, that would be more than 23 hundred dollars uh that's a lot of money though that's a lot it, of money it really is it's really and here's the whole thing i'm going to warn you ahead of time we're not going to charge you that much money we don't i don't have the heart for it not even and that. one of the things that we realize that if we charged what it was worth only rich people would be able to afford what we're doing we did not want to go in that direction we so sure what we have don't. done is we've gone all the way in the other direction so we had that you know we had two choices and our choice our choice, even though it's worth over $2,300, is we're taking the second option. Right now, we're making this entire course available for only $99. You read right, and 99. quite frankly, we you know, I don't feel like it's a good idea for us to offer as much in there as we're offering right now, but... The fact is that that was the package. That was what the, we've been offering that package at a higher price. Some of you have seen this webinar before, so you know. We were offering it for two hundred and forty nine. We offered it for two ninety seven. Yes. We're offering it, you know. So this is literally the lowest price we've ever had for this particular course on Afrofuturism. And, it, and by the way, there's another bonus. It's not even just the Afrofuturism because we're including all the extras that people got at the higher price, including the complete revolutionary writing six-week course again this was a live course we did it for six weeks where we had students live and we talked about all of the issues that writers face when they're trying to write specifically to create change in the world so it could be about how do you use theme uh, to amplify social justice issues while not losing the meat of your story and your characters storytelling in general Again, it was lectures and guests, and we had some great guests. We had Zach Stentz, who wrote uh, Thor. We had Effie Brown, you know that name from Dear White People. She was a producer, but from Project Greenlight, where she took Matt Damon to task. Daniel Jose Older, uh, who's pictured on the far right. Some of you know him. Nisi Shaw. Yes, Kate, Nisi. Kate Tempest Bradford spoke on writing the other. Say you want to be more inclusive, but you're afraid of making a mistake writing the other. They came to speak of, uh, to us about that. And in the middle uh, of the top, you see David Gerald there, who, who wrote, he, by the way, he's a, a novelist, and, and he's written many, many things, but some of you will still know him best as the writer of the Trouble with Tribbles episode of Star Trek, and he was speaking uh, on LGBT issues in, in, in writing. So we're doing all of this, and the, the value, we're now talking, it's, it's ridiculous. I look at this, and I'm thinking, about it, we've got to take some of this stuff out. But it's too much. We didn't want to but take right, it out. We're not taking it out Honestly, yet. Honestly, some of these we might sell as separate. Yeah, we, we will after, after after Christmas. Right. You know, we what we what we want to do is we want to reach as many of you as we possibly can, and so that's why even though the value on this is you know up to up to over three thousand dollars, this is only ninety nine dollars, and you can get it over at AfrofuturismWebinar.com. dot com. www dot Yeah, please do yourself a favor. I can promise you, it will never be cheaper than this, and in fact. As soon as we get through with the holidays, I'm, t I'm pulling some of this stuff out. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. You know, there really is. Um, and we're very proud of this. And, you know, there's a 30-day guarantee. If for any reason you don't like what we're, what we're offering you, just let us know. We'll give you your money back. We're just, we're just trying to do something good here. You know, other courses can give you academic understanding of what's going on. But Tanana Reeve and I are actually in the trenches every single day creating Afrofuturism, creating dark fantasy, creating the things that, that 
connect our mythology. I'm trying to, the, to I'm to writing a science fiction story right now, you know, that is helping me process the political times that, that we've been living in. So so yes, www.afrofuturismwebinar.com. We have another testimonial from Denny Upkins. Yes. He says, after each class, I felt galvanized to tackle my writing. And as a result, I have made sales. If you're serious about taking your writing to the next level, then I cannot recommend this class enough. So, you know, God. And then uh, Jenny Underwood, the 10-year-old, the her 10-year-old is watching parts of the Afrofuturism class with me and already wants to write when she grows up. Thank you and Tanana Rebdu for helping me to teach my family. And we've gotten so many comments from people who think that, you know, that, that the package is just amazing, that the price is just amazing. And that has really touched my heart. I want to find the, the way going into 2018. I want to make sure that people who have want to support the art, create the art, or teach other people to do it, know how to. Have that opportunity to do it because it's been such a, a huge, uh, it's had such a huge impact on my life my world and certainly steve that's how we met. It made we, my life we literally met through afrofuturism yes. so uh, we're creating the work and we're sharing the work but we also want to help you either just further appreciate it or use it to inspire you to create your own work or that's your right. kids or maybe you have a student you know who's a standout and this will be the perfect gift if they've earned it you know <laughs> if, they've it. Uh, if they've turned in all their work and they did what they were supposed to do but really, that was what we wanted to share with you. We're really excited about this price. Uh, this is the first time we've lowered it uh, to $99. And we love the idea that so many people get to experience it in that Please, price. please share this with anyone you know who is a writer, who's interested in Afrofuturism. Or a fan, a fan. Yeah, you know, it's worth more than 10 times as much as we're charging for it. I swear to God. The, but... The beautiful thing about, the elect about electronic media is that once we've broken even... Once we're into the black, we can drop prices. Yeah, we can drop We can price. do this for you we guys. We had a lot, I mean, a lot of preparation to do the 10-week course, and it, it was a lot of time. But now that the course is basically in the bag and it's digital download, we can lower we, that We're moving you. on. You know, we're moving on to other things. There'll yes. be other projects. We have but on this project, too, yes. this is our way of saying to you, we love you guys. We want you to succeed. We want you to support the artists that are out there. Let us help you www.afrofuturismwebinar.com. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Go out and create. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care, people. www.afrofuturismwebinar.com.